The other really important concept that we need to introduce is the basis of a vector space. So the basis of a vector space is a linearly independent set of vectors spanning that space. And another way of putting this is that it is a subset of all of the vectors in that space, such that every single vector in the space can be written as a weighted sum of that subset. And finally, bases are not unique. You can, for any vector space, you can find lots and lots of basis sets. And that's really key. That's a key concept that we're going to return to. So to fill in the mathematical formalism, let's define a set S that has a bunch of vectors in it, you know, VI through VN, uh, where all of these belong to a vector space V. I can say that S is linearly independent if the weighted summation of those vectors VI is equal to zero, if and only if every one of those weights is zero where the weights are members of the field that the vector space is defined over. So there, there's no dependent quantities here, right? The only way that I can get all of these things to sum to zero, scaling them by scalar multiplication, is if all of those weights are zero. And so that means that there's no linear dependence. I cannot write any elements of this set S as a weighted summation of the other elements, because if I could do that, then this would not hold. I could find a set of weights, that I could put for all the other vectors and then get the remaining V I, the set, so that all of them equal zero. So that's linear independence. And S is said to span V if there always exists a set of scalars in the field that the vector space is defined over, such that for any other element B of the vector space V, I can write B as a weighted summation of this set. And so that is a spanning set. I can express every single element of my vector space as a summation of this set weighted by some scalar measure numbers. So taken together, these two things define a basis. And so that means that a basis, if you start this long enough, you can convince yourself that it is a minimal spanning set. It is a spanning set that has no additional elements to it, no more than you strictly need. And so a spanning set for the R3 vector space, for the Euclidean real numbers, the geometric vectors, that is going to have three elements to it. So three vectors will define the basis of the Euclidean vector space. And those three vectors taken together form what we in dynamics know as a reference frame. So the way that we will be defining reference frames in this course is we will give them a name. So a ref this reference frame is called I, and it has three unit vectors associated with it, E1, E2, and E3. And while, strictly speaking, a coordinate origin is not required to define a vector space, it is really convenient to define a point that is fixed within this space. Right? Because the reference frame is our way of measuring space, is a way of defining the directions of space. And so we will tack on a coordinate origin for use later. Um, and so there's a distinction being made here, you'll notice, between reference frames and coordinate systems. And it's a real distinction. Right? The reference frame is a set of three unit vectors. It is a way of tracking which direction we're moving in space. But the actual magnitudes of our motion, the, the measure numbers, those are the coordinates. And you can have many, many different coordinate systems for a single reference frame. The simplest coordinate system, the most basic one, is the one that tracks magnitudes along each of the three unit directions. And so those are called the Cartesian coordinates. So for any vector describing any point P with respect to the coordinate origin O, in our notation, we call that R of P rel O, I can split this into a weighted sum of my basis. And the weights I'll just call x1, x2, and x3. And in this particular case, x1, x2, x3 represent Cartesian coordinates because they are the coordinates that map along the three unit directions defining the space. We also have another little bit of notation that we're gonna find particularly useful. We will call the coordinate set associated with the vector representation, its components, right? So these are called the vector components in the iframe. So we are going to represent the measure numbers, the coordinates, the Cartesian coordinates of the representation of this vector R, P, R, L, O in components of frame I 
as an array of numbers. So this is key. A vector is not just an array of three numbers. A vector is an array of three numbers plus a reference frame definition. So it's really important to understand that if I don't have this subscript here that in my notation defines what frames components I'm writing this in, this definition is incomplete. The way that I denote this is that I put brackets around my vector and I put a sub subscript defining the frame. And then that's the same as me writing out x1, x2, x3. And um, in our notation, this will always be a column vector for uh, mathematical reasons that will become obvious in a little bit. So again, I have a vector pointing from O to P. That vector is a completely frame independent quantity. It is just a geometric blob having a magnitude and direction. I can then define a reference frame that has three unit directions, E1, E2, E3, hat, these are unit directions. And I can then split this position vector into components in this frame with measure numbers X1, X2, X3. And these measure numbers map directly to the Cartesian coordinates of that. And so finally, I can denote all of this by using this array notation, always keeping track of what frame I'm expressing the components in. As already stated, a single reference frame can have an infinite number of coordinate systems. The Cartesian coordinates are the simplest one. They're the one that maps along the three unit directions defining our frame, but there's two other very convenient coordinate systems that we're going to be coming back to very frequently. So let's point them out here. The first are the polar or cylindrical coordinates. And so the polar coordinates are defined as the in-plane projection of our vector pointing from O to P. That's this given by this line with a magnitude of rho. And then finally, the third, the, the thing that makes them cylindrical is that we retain the third component along the E3 direction. And so as you've seen many times in many other contexts, the mapping between the Cartesian coordinates and the uh, polar coordinates is X is rho cosine theta, Y is rho sine theta, and Z is just Z. We can go further and define the spherical coordinates, which are now replacing our all of the Cartesian coordinates with two angles and a magnitude of the vector. So R in this case, right, that R is equal to the magnitude of R of P rel O, like so. Uh, so that's why we make a distinction. Rho is not the magnitude of it. Rho is the magnitude of the projection down to this plane. And we will formally define projection in just a little bit. So in the spherical set, we have the magnitude times this stuff. And if you look at this, this defines a unit vector, right? Because if you take the norm of this, you will always get a norm of one. The thing to be super careful about is how these angles are defined because there's multiple different conventions. And so in this course, we're just gonna pick one convention and try to stick to it religiously. And so we will always, when we're talking about spherical coordinates, define theta as an azimuthal angle. And usually we will define phi as a zenith angle, zenith meaning measured down from this E3 direction. Now, in some contexts, especially when we're talking about named coordinate systems, uh, we will need to be using a spherical coordinate system that is an azimuth angle and an elevation angle. And the elevation is just the complement to phi. And whenever that happens, we will point that out. But by default, we're going to go with theta is azimuth, phi is zenith. And in other contexts, you will find that these definitions are reversed. So phi is either uh, the uh, azimuth or something uh, else, uh, another symbol is used entirely. And, and so it's just, you have to be very careful to keep track and make sure that you're not gonna be making little trigonometric mistakes because of the basic definitions of things. So this will be our default definition. And now is a good time to remind you of spherical trigonometry. Uh, a lot of the fundamental results that we will be developing later on in the course have to do with the application of spherical trigonometry. And spherical trigonometry is operating on triangles defined on a unit sphere. And in, because of the nature of the things that we're gonna be studying, this comes up quite a bit. So as a very, very quick, quick primer, and I will point you to the first chapter of Green's uh, spherical astronomy book, which is a really, really good, much more thorough review of, of spherical trigonometry. But for, for now, let's just remind ourselves of some very basic concepts. We have a unit sphere, like so, and we can pass planes through the sphere. Any plane passing through the center of the sphere, which we'll denote as O, 
intersects the sphere in what is known as a great circle. So this circle here, the one crossing X and Q and Y, that is a great circle. Anything else, any plane that doesn't pass through the center of a sphere produces a small circle. And so R, P, and S is an arc of a small circle. The great circle will have two points that are perpendicular to its plane and on the, on the unit sphere, and those are called the poles. So Z here is a pole of the great circle X, that has an arc X, Q, and Y. And if you're mapping in your head to concepts that you're probably already familiar with, you can think of this as the equator, and this is the north and the south pole of the Earth, for example, in the model where the Earth is a perfect sphere. All right. So a line perpendicular to the plane and passing through O will intersect the sphere at the poles of the great circle. So that's the same statement that we just made. Here's that line that passes through O and is perpendicular to the plane that generated this equatorial circle. It passes through the north and the south pole here. The spherical angle between intersecting great circle arcs is the angle between their planes. So as a practical example, for this diagram, the spherical angle x, z, q, right? so x to z to q, so you'd follow these arc lengths along, is going to be exactly the same as the angle between the planes, between the relevant planes of those circles. And so in this case, that is the angle theta. So the spherical angle x, z, q is theta is the same as this planar normal angle theta in the planar projection. And it is also exactly equivalent to the great circle arc from X to Q, this part of the great circle. We can thus write the unit vector of R PRL O, the same example that we were doing previously, as the cosine of the arc XP, the sine of the arc YP and the cosine of the arc ZP, like so. So here's XP dashed, here's YP dashed, and here is ZP, that part of the arc. And so this is an equivalent formulation to the spherical angles that we've previously defined. There's a lot of other results that we're gonna bring up as they become relevant, but just as we talk about spherical trigonometry, you may wanna uh, flash back to this picture and just stare at it for a while to make sure that you have the geometric relationships in place in your head. And again, for a lot more detail, please see the first couple of chapters in green.